I'm going to say Thursday, August 5th, 2021. Uh, the Commission on Equitable Housing and Development meeting has now commenced. It is, I just said that, March, uh, it's actually August 5th at 4 p.m. The meeting is held virtually due to COVID-19 to allow for, allow for social distancing and to protect public health. As we continue our efforts in meeting remotely, we ask all commissioners and guests to mute yourselves until called upon to speak to avoid feedback and background noise. For those who have dialed in using the call-in number, to unmute yourselves to speak, dial star six on your phone. Also, prior to speaking, please announce who you are to identify yourself. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. We ask that you only use the chat function to request to speak or to announce you are leaving the meeting so we can track the quorum. Also, in order to comply with the state open meeting law, attendance and voter will be done by way of roll call using audio, not by using the chat function. So with that, I'll start the roll call of our voting members. Uh, Michael Edmonds, is your microphone working? Okay, well, I can see you said here, but I couldn't hear you. Uh, Olga Flores. Here. Sharia Jimenez. Present. Monica Lane. Monica is absent. Uh, Jim Topol, I am present. Liz Wilson. Here. Uh, Jay Young is absent today. Uh, Mindy Bernstein. Present. And Lori Mazurbo. Present. Okay, so we have uh, two absent uh, members, so we do have a quorum. Um, our ex officio members, Maggie Amato Tejas, Wendy Asher. Just in time. Good afternoon. Hey, Wendy. Marianne Beerling. Mark Clark. Present. Hey, Mark. Vicki Casino. Uh, Marcos, I think I saw you. I'm here. Hey, Marcos. Betty Viegas. Okay. Corin Manning. Present. Okay, Corin and Liz Morales. I am present. Okay, with that, um, our first agenda item is to review and adopt the meeting minutes from our July 6th meeting. Uh, the meeting minutes are, I think, have been sent out to everybody and they're also available on the website. Um, actually, they're, oh yeah, the draft meetings are here. So I guess I would ask, uh, or a motion to approve the minutes. Motion's been made by Mindy. Is there a second? I second. Okay, seconded by Lori. Are there any changes to the meeting minutes? Yes, Mindy. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if it's possible to, and when I was reading over them, um, the minutes, I had to go back to listen to the video because I couldn't remember the content and it just might be me and my brain at this time. And I was wondering with our minutes, if we could summarize what the conversation was on the minutes. That might not be necessary because I can always go back and listen to the review on the recordings. Um, it's just a thought, but not necessarily an action that needs to be taken. Just curious. Thank you. I'm, I'm frankly okay with that going forward. Um, maybe just kind of the bullet point of the, of the major discussion items or um, points that came up. Um, as long as 
none of the commission members are the ones keeping minutes. I'm okay with that. I've been uh, someone who's kept minutes many times in my life. And it's a very difficult task that takes up a lot of time. Um, and I just would like to be respectful of the fact that, you know, city, city staff members are doing this. And um, I don't know if this is something that's part of like someone's job title or something to that effect. Um, I know that we do this on a volunteer basis and I just don't want it to be something that gets passed off to one of us as like a secretary position um, and that like a standard gets set where like the meeting minutes become highly voluminous because I know that I was like on a committee where um, meeting minutes were that and it was frankly terrible. Okay, I think uh, we need to find the right balance, Liz. Yeah, and you know, I'm I'm gonna ask uh, Vanessa Gonzalez, who is primarily responsible for that, to to provide any input. But we definitely want to try to. There's a one a format that we need to follow, and there's a di different document that we have to submit to mayor and council around actions that have been taken. So it just makes sense that it you know that staff, but that does not mean you know, that we wouldn't have someone maybe help or review them. Um, totally open to that. It is time consuming. Um, and that's why we don't necessarily put that on the commission members because we know all of you have other work to do. So we want to be respectful of your time. Okay. Vanessa, do you... Uh... Do you have any comments or input on this one well, since we're talking about it and then we'll move on? No, it's fine. I can I can try and summarize as much as possible. We also submit the legal action report um, that goes to the Board of Commissioners as well. That kind of summarizes the meeting ahead of time before the meeting minutes. Okay. Okay, so uh, any other uh, comments or feedbacks on, on the meeting minutes before we approve them? Okay, I'll go through and do a quick roll call to approve the minutes. Uh, Michael Edmonds? That's a yes. Olga Flores? Yes. Sharia Jimenez? Yes. Liz Wilshin? Yes. Mindy Bernstein? Yes, please. Lori Mazurbo? Yes. Okay, minutes are approved. Okay, the next agenda item is sub subcommittee discussion. Um, apologize about missing our last meeting. Um, but it sounded like from, uh, from what I heard, it was a very um, productive meeting. And, um, you know, I think we've got a good subcommittee structure in place. We do, however, need to have a formal motion created to create the subcommittees. Uh, there are three, as a, as a reminder, on the website, uh, there's a listing of the three subcommittees and their goals. Uh, the first subcommittee is the Affordable Housing Subcommittee. The second is the Permanent Supportive Housing Subcommittee. And the third is the Housing Segregation Subcommittee. So each subcommittee cannot have more than five voting members uh, and each member of the commission should be a, uh, a part of one of the subcommittees. So uh, for example, if on the affordable housing subcommittee there were five voting members, a quorum would be three individuals. So quorum also has to be met on the subcommittees. If there are three members, a uh, quorum would be two individuals. Same thing if there are four, it would be two individuals. So members of the public and pe people who are not participating on this commission are invited to participate on the subcommittees. Uh, we have the same uh, open meeting laws and requirements on the subcommittees that we do on this meeting. So um, what we've talked about with, the, uh, with Liz and Ann 
was they would have one member of the housing department attend each of the subcommittees, but we won't have the same level of participation that we would at this group. Um, and then ideally, we'd like to set up a, a day and a time for the subcommittees to meet. And uh, my understanding is from our last meeting is that uh, we want to continue these meetings on a monthly basis. And in addition to these, we'd like to have the subcommittees meet once a month as well and report back to this com to the commission on, uh, on the status each month. So um, we're going to have to create a motion, but I'd, go, I'd like to go ahead and open it up for discussion. Um, just as a point of order, I do need to withdraw my name as co-chair for the Permanent and Supportive Housing Subcommittee. Okay. So, um, right now, would you guys like me to kind of the list that we have in place right now, I don't remember if this is on the master agenda, um, but would you like me to go through who's on which subcommittee right now? Review that. Uh, uh, Mr. Okay. Mr. Chair, I, I'll just say this. I think it's good to share the update so people know where people are listed, but for the sake of the, we don't have to have uh, assign the people, just the, the creation of the subcommittees is what we need to make sure the motion is about. Okay. All right. So do you think we should go ahead and create the motion and then assign people? Uh, I, th I don't know that they have to, one has to be before the other, unless someone else can correct me. But I believe the motion is about creating the subcommittees and then the assignments can, uh, they're, you know, can be changing as needed. But I, I may be I don't know if anyone else who works with commissions has has a okay. better knowledge on that than than I do. Okay, Mindy. I make a motion that we vote on the establishment of the three subcommittees. Okay, the affordable housing, the permanent supportive housing, and the higher housing segregation. Correct. Correct. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and the second. Um, I'd like to open it up for discussion. This is going to be easy. <laughs> okay, well, let's go ahead and call the question. Um, the motion is to establish uh, three new subcommittees for the Housing Commission. The first is the affordable housing, the second is the permanent supportive housing, the third is the housing segregation. Uh, Michael Edmonds. Is that an aye? Aye. Okay, that's an aye. Olga Flores? Aye. Sharia Jimenez? Aye. Liz Wilson. Aye. Mindy Bernstein. Aye. Lori Mazurbo. Aye. All right, the motion passes. So um, right now, let's we'll talk about, I guess, who's on which subcommittee, and then um, we'd like to talk about who's going to chair each subcommittee, and you know, I guess it's up to the chairs to determine when each subcommittee meets. If you guys would like to discuss that in this group, I'm fine with that as well. So right now, the um, for the affordable housing, uh, we have Olga and Sharia are going to be co-chairs. Uh, I'm going to be a participating member of that uh, subcommittee. On the permanent supportive housing subcommittee, we have Mindy and Liz. We do not have a chair identified right now. And then on the housing segregation, uh, Jay and Lori um, are both, the, both asked to be co-chair of that. So, um, Michael, do you have a, 
preference on which subcommittee you'd like to be a part of? Segregation, okay. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and put you in for that. So Manika is not here. I will follow up with Manika after this meeting. Liz and Jay are assigned. Mindy and Lori. Okay, so the only voting member who's not currently assigned is Monika. Um, yes, Mindy. Uh Thank you, Liz, for letting us know ahead of time about um, rescinding the, but there was your position as a co-chair. There's, I was reading through some minutes that had another person on the um, permanent and supported housing that was interested in, co in being the chairperson. I don't remember who that was. Does anybody remember who that was? That was me, um, but I've changed to the segregation um, committee. Okay after speaking, speaking with Ann. So let's go through the ex officio members too, because um, uh, Corin, you are currently set up for the affordable housing. And then Marianne Beerling is, and then Maggie amato Teas is also on affordable housing. I don't think Maggie's here today. She's absent. Um, Wendy, Asher, um, you're on a permanent supportive housing? Yes. Okay, and Liz. I guess, so I guess I'd like to put it out to to uh, Mindy and Wendy, are either of you interested in being the chair of that committee? I am not. <laughs> How about it, Mindy? Um, there, I would, <laughs> I am concerned about my ability to chair. And it's not that I don't have experience in facilitating and participating. I, um, I don't know if all, any of you know my husband passed away a year, a month and three weeks ago. And I'm finding myself still struggling through grief and never knowing day to day my ability to even get out of bed. Okay. So I, I'm concerned about chairing. I will absolutely be, I'm passionate about permanent and supported housing. It's on my uh, agenda for my life work. Um, and I would be willing to give it a try. And if unsuccessful, we could look for someone else that I, those are just putting it out there that those are what my my concerns are. Okay. My, limited, my limited brain capacity. And I'm getting to be a senior citizen. So it's, you know, choking. Uh, Jim, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, willing to chair that if, if it's, uh, I think you said an ex officio can chair. I'm happy to co-chair or chair that. Okay, thank you, Liz. And I'm willing Liz, to we'll co-chair. If you're the chair, Liz. Okay, uh, Liz Wilson. Um, yeah, I just I have some transitional things going on in my personal life right now, and so I just know that I can't make a commitment right now to chair. But I know that it's very likely that in perhaps a couple of months I could take on that responsibility. Um, so I just wanted to withdraw my name knowing what my capacity is right now. Understood, yeah. Okay, so um, we have a couple of ex officio members who have not, who are not on a subcommittee. Um, Mark Clark, do you have a preference? Yes, 
my preference would be affordable housing. Okay. Okay. And, can I uh, can I say something, Jim? For can I speak for one of the ex officios who I know just can't be here right now, uh, Betty sure. Viegas? Um, she yes. will be on the affordable housing one. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, and then the, let's see, who else is there? Marcos. Affordable housing as well. Okay. okay. We might need a sub subcommittee for the affordable housing. <laughs> yeah. Sharia, good luck with that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You're going to do great. And Olga, both of you are going to do great. Um, okay, so in terms of timing, do uh, I guess I'm going to put it out to the chairs. Do you, would you guys prefer to kind of handle that on your own through a doodle poll or email, or would you like to talk about it in this group? Sharia, you decide for affordable housing. I'm definitely the co-chair. I just want to put it on record. I think it'd be more efficient to handle all that via doodle poll and not in this meeting. Um, and we can assist if you if any of the chairs want assistance with that, we can send it out what, now that we have the committees. Um, happy to facilitate that. Yeah, that'd be that'd be great. And then there's a few others we had in mind, I think, that we wanted to invite to that committee. I think it's gonna be a pretty big one, but that's okay. I, I think that's great. Um, people don't always show up, so it's it'll be great and then um uh what was i gonna say but yeah if i could just get the list and then i can go and with emails i can go from there and um liz do you know how much how, how much notice do we need to provide the public uh in terms of when the meeting is going to occur is it two weeks i i'm not certain on that i don't know if vanessa or anybody else knows that question Okay, well, I guess my recommendation is then to the chairs is, um, you know, maybe over the next week, if you could get something on the calendar that's a week to two weeks out, that would probably give us enough time to put out all the public notifications and everything and have something before our next commission meeting. Mindy. I just had a question about the housing first um affordable the uh permanent there's only i'm only counting three of us liz the two liz's and i there were no other people um i also wanted to bring uh, attention regarding the subcommittees that the jewish high holidays are coming up in september rosh hashanah and yom kippur and to please keep that in mind when setting up the subcommittees that I know this is a Christian country, um, but there are a handful of us that uh, celebrate those holidays. Thank you. So. All right, so we still have two individuals that we need to get assigned to subcommittee, Monica and Vicki. Um, so I'm hopeful that uh, at least um, one of them will be willing to participate on the housing segregation. I believe from what Ann said, as long as we have two voting members on the committee, that's the minimum. So I think we're okay if the committees are two or three, so. Okay. Mike, did you have something? Yeah, just real quick. I, I assume you can hear me now. I'm using the phone for audio. Things were working fine an hour and a half ago. I don't know what happened. Um, the reason I, I was uh, interested in the segregation committee, uh, Jim, is because it looked like, uh, according to my notes, we only had two people on that committee. Uh, so I didn't want that to be too thin. Uh, so at this moment, it seems like it's uh, just Jay, Lori, and I. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. All right. Uh, do we have any? Well, no, we only have three committees. All right. Uh, I retract the question. Thanks. 
Okay, before we move on to agenda item number four, I just want to put it out there if there's any last thoughts or comments on our subcommittees. I have one last comment. Um, I understand that uh, when it was when you introduced it, Jim, that it's not, the subcommittees aren't limited to um, commission members. Uh, so I'm gonna encourage my staff to indicate which committees they will participate on. So there's also city staff on those. So we will um, get that figured out in the next couple of days. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, let's move on to the next agenda item. Um, the commission update the mayor and council and... Jim, I'm sorry, Mindy had her hand up. I have a quick oh, question, Jim, ahead. apologies. Are we able, as commission members, there's a primary subcommittee that I will be attending. Is there any restriction to attending other subcommittees? I don't think so because they're open public. Okay, thank you. Just yep. That's true. Thank you. Okay. Did um, on the website we have a draft of the um, communication, our first communication to Mayor and Council? Um, Liz, you want to go ahead and talk before I start this topic? Yeah, yeah. Are you trying to? I want to make sure because I know Liz Wilson had her hand up. I wasn't sure yeah, if you were talking like, to Liz. I was talking to Liz Wilson. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yes, I had a question about um, given the size of the subcommittees, um, are public members of the public able to join any of the subcommittees in any capacity? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. And is there going to be any sort of like? clarity on that process for members of the public? So I think what we'll do is we'll announce the meeting and then anyone who wants to come from the public, then we can dis discuss if they want to serve on the committee, how that works. I, I don't have details on how that works myself. So when Anne returns, I, just by the way, Anne Cheneka took a, a much deserved vacation. So she's not here today. So, um, but I will say that we will, for each of those meetings, we'll make sure to discuss um, non-commission members and how the public can participate. Okay, good. Are we ready to move on to the next topic? Are you good, Liz? All right. Um, on, on our website, there's a draft of the communication to mayor and council. I'd like to uh, quickly kind of uh, summarize what's in this and um, solicit any feedback. Um, does, would it be best if I shared my screen or does everybody able to pull it up? I'll tell you what, I'll share my screen. Um, I think that there are some members of the public in this. Okay. So can you guys see this? Yes. Yes. Okay, so, so basically this is the first communication uh, and as a draft, so we can still make changes. Um, so the quick overview that says that the meeting is going to be held on the first Thursday of each month. Um, lists our website, uh, talks about the subcommittees. Here are our uh, voting members. We do have one vacant position that was recently approved um, by mayor and council. So uh, I think we've started, we're starting a search to fill that position. We also have the, the uh, ex officio members who are listed. And this is just a brief summary of the topics uh, discussed at our commission meeting so far. So we had a uh, a welcome and a background on the commission um, by uh, the mayor and uh, council member Santa Cruz. We went through the open meeting law information from the city of Tucson clerk's office. 
Uh, we reviewed the people, communities, and homes investment plan from the housing uh, uh, housing staff. Uh, we talked about the housing market study by the U of A Ellers College. Uh, the central business, business district research and updates by the city of Tucson economics and incentives director. There was an affordable housing overview by Joan Services, who's the executive director of the Arizona Housing Coalition. Uh, Sharia uh, reviewed the accessory dwelling unit ordinance. Um, and then we, uh, we reviewed the affordable housing density bonus for the Sunshine, Sunshine Mile Overlay District by Planning and Development Services. Um, our mission and goals have uh, been adjusted so that our revised mission statement is the commission will review, investigate, and recommend actions to mayor and council based on research data and inclusive public input to increase the number of housing units that will, one, develop and preserve affordability for all Tucsonans, including renters, homeowners, and those without housing, two, protect our barrios and communities from rapid change and displacement, as well as the structural, as well as structural disinvestment, and three, cultivate landlords and developers as partners in providing equitable, accessible, and quality housing. So we, we adopted this on June 1st. Uh, we established both short-term and long-term goals uh, through the, the two session uh, goal setting uh, meetings that we had. So our short-term goals, which we're gonna, we wanna try to accomplish in the next 18 months, are to provide a set of recommendations to mayor and council on activities, levers, and tools the city can leverage to increase momentum around affordable housing. Two, identify new funding opportunities for affordable housing. Three, provide recommendations on policies to increase and accelerate available permanent supportive housing. And then our long-term goals, which are over the next two to five years, are to deliver a sufficient number, which is a TBD at this point, of new affordable housing units within the city of Tucson. Two, to address housing segregation by race, ethnicity, disability, and access to opportunities in Tucson. Three, provide recommendations on policies to increase and accelerate available permanent supportive housing. And four, to identify new funding opportunities for affordable housing. So the three subcommittees which we just voted on and approved are the affordable housing, permanent supportive housing, and housing segregation. So with that, I'd like to open it up if, if, if uh, anyone has a change to this letter. Everybody's good with it? Mindy? Um, I read it through earlier today and the day before. It's very thorough, very clear. I make a motion that, do we need to approve it? Is this? I believe we do. I think, I think just to be on the safe side, let's go ahead and do that. I make a motion to approve this draft as written. Okay, do we have a second? I'll second that motion. Okay, seconded by Will, Liz Wilson, and motion was made by Mindy. Any comments or just other changes before we vote? Yes, Mindy. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to take my hand down. I just want to say it was so well written. Thank you, whoever wrote it. Yes, I agree. Was it who who wrote this? Was this Vanessa? Or I'm not sure. Um, I, I, someone with Anne put this together, so yeah. I'm I'm not sure. Vanessa, do you know who wrote it? I do not know who wrote it. Okay. Yeah, it might have been Anne or Allison or Rachel, one of the. Uh, well, maybe they'll put it in the chat. So thank you to whoever did it. Yeah, we did it. Thank you. Okay, so let's go ahead and and. Uh, call the question, uh, Michael Edmonds. I approve. Olga Flores. Approve. Sorry. Maria Jimenez. Approve. Liz Wilson. Yes, I approve. 
Mindy Bernstein. I approve. Lori Miservo. Approve. Okay, passed. Thank you very much. Okay, our next agenda item is agenda item number five, uh, the housing study, uh, HCD study session items and updates. Uh, so Liz, I'm gonna yeah. hand it over okay. to you. So, um, hello again. I'm going to, uh, been asked by the mayor to put together um, an in-depth conversation around affordable housing. Uh, for both mayor and council and for the public. Um, and so it's not with the idea that we'll figure it all out in what it's a 90 minute, it might go 90 minutes, hopefully it'll go less, but um, it, I will share a little bit of the presentation. It's still, please know it's still in draft form, but would love your feedback in case there's any being that we're missing that um, you would recommend that is included. So let me figure out how to, ah, let me see here. Okay, sorry, definitely trying to figure this out here. All right, this is not working. All right, can everyone see that? No, uh, Jim, I think you're still sharing your screen, are you? No, okay. Do you see it? It might take a second, but it should be a PowerPoint that says comprehensive strategy. It's up, Liz. Okay, great. All righty, so I'm just, uh, some things I'll be talking about, this will be the talking points. Um, and again, I don't, plan to go through every detail item, but I do want to talk to mayor and council set the foundation around what's affordability and what do we consider as house, affordable housing. Um, many of you might be familiar with the housing continuum. Oops. Um, I'm not going to be talking about homelessness and shelter, but we know that supportive housing, affordable rental housing, affordable home ownership is really what we're going to be talking about. Um, and zeroing in on um, what is affordable housing. That's the big question right now um, is making sure people understand what it falls under. Um, I'll go a little bit into detail about the 30% is, is usually the, the way we measure if it's affordable, um, but really zeroing in on what's the area of median income. Again, this slide's not done here, but really trying to understand who we're talking about and where the gap is for, for those in our, in our city, in our community um, that really is in need. For. What's the poverty definition that you're using here, Liz? So this is around area median income. So, the, and the poverty definition of course is uh, the one that's the federal poverty. So I, again, this was some things I put in there but I'm gonna go in a little more in depth, but if you have some recommendations on what I should hit, let me know. Okay. So this is uh, something I borrowed from um, another website that talks about the number, uh, what it costs for people, whether they're a part-time retail worker, healthcare support worker, a single parent um, or family with two. Uh, that has, you know, a higher education. So here it shows what, where they're at on the median income. It also shows what they could afford at, for rent or for home price. It kind of drives um, the point of where um, the need is. Um, I'm going to just do some reviewing of what funding we have received through the American Rescue Plan. Um, and these are some things that I know mayor and council is wanting to understand where, where our funding is coming in and how it, how it affects um, uh, the housing piece. Uh, again, we get home program that's around developing affordable housing. That's how much we get annually. Our housing choice voucher program gets about 47 million in housing assistance, uh, rental assistance monies, our public housing 
we get about 10 million um, to, to support the public housing uh, efforts. And then we have our program called HAPWA, which provides rental and supportive services. Um, this breaks out some of the things and how we, um, as a city, our, with our federal funds, what we do um, to support affordable housing through our units. Also, we've provided um, up 13.4 million in home loans to nine properties in the last five years. Um, since we've received the CARES funds, we've served 117 households in rapid rehousing. I'm trying to get the number of how many permanent supportive housing units. And then currently we have 83 beds through our the properties we purchased and we expect to get another 98 in the next 90 days for those who are experiencing homelessness. Um, we also get emergency solutions grant, um, our home repair program and our down payment assistance that's for home ownership for low income moderate uh, income households and then our lead hazard control those are uh, mitigating lead based paint in homes. Um, and we often couple that with our home repair program if there's needs in the home um, to get the, the home in good, uh, you know, address any repair needs. I wanted to touch on the myth busting about Section 8. You know, one of the things I've heard and when we're taught having affordable housing conversations is we want affordable housing, but not Section 8. And that tends to be um, that those are both affordable housing options. So we, we um, Section 8 is an important uh, program that we need to get more landlords to participate with us. And also to have neighbors um, understand what Section 8 does and what it is not. So I was just gonna hit some of these um, uh, myths that we often hear. So some things that we're currently working in, we're bringing in experts to help us develop, do some real development projects. Um, Tucson House, we will soon have a co-developer on board. We've also uh, put out an RFP and created a pool of finance consultants and other affordable housing experts. Should we need um, uh, help with specific projects, we can call on those uh, consultants to help us a lot of it is around financing and layering what, what the funding that we need. We also have four parcels that we're um, planning to develop sooner than later. And so we hope to roll that out in the next year. We have a vision for expanding affordable housing um, that we created through the, the PCHIP plan. I know many of you were involved with that and we received a lot of community input around the priorities and the goals. So I wanted to just um, refresh the mayor and council about what is in our PCHIP plan and with, and with the hopes that we're gonna expand on this. So our PCHIP, when it talks about uh, the home uh, section of our plan, it's around increasing affordable rental housing and we have developed some goals around that. It is also about expanding affordable housing options and as you can see, there's three goals um, under that priority. Ensuring st ensure stable, healthy, and safe housing. And then the last one is increased housing equity. So all the work that the commission's doing really will fall under all those um, priorities that are in the PCHIP, and I think they fit really well. My thought is as we do the work through the commission, we can develop a larger strategy, uh, strategic plan um, that will help um, flesh out what is in the PCHIP. So I do want to share um, an update. I'll probably use a lot of what we just reviewed that is in the update from Mayor and Council. I want to share the good work that all of you are doing and how you will contribute to this effort. So talking about tools, um, Mayor and Council is very interested in understanding what tools are available. Um, I will be going a little more in depth on what low income housing tax credit is. Also, we know that um, the city of Tucson, we do have a housing trust fund. Um, some communities use their housing trust fund to create a revolving loan fund that provides some gap uh, funding, as well as developing a development corporation out of uh, in our department so we, as we do these projects, we have um, 
an umbrella where, in which this, those projects go under in which we can apply for these tax credits or other types of financing. We also have uh, project-based vouchers. We currently have 330 that are um, in specific projects around Tucson, um, but we have a capacity to do more project-based vouchers. I think it's really important that we're strategic in how we use them because it is, we do have a cap. And so it, we could reach that cap very quickly if we're not careful in how we utilize them. Also partnerships, I will bring up our, uh, the ability for us to work with the IDA. I think is a very um, uh, good partnership that we can help uh, expand our affordable housing through joint financing and joint um, ventures on, on projects. And then of course we know with the land trust, um, we have uh, Pima, uh, Pima County, I'm sorry, I'm gonna picklet. I'm just gonna say picklet because I'm, I'm gonna get it wrong. Um, and we have SALT and we have other ones in, that we can work together with and ensure we have the long-term affordability. So this, so I just wanna go a little bit into low-income housing tax credit and understand what, what it is and how um, having tax credits helps get projects completed, but often there is still a gap that is needed and that's why there's often a need to get other type of financing. Um, whether it's federal or uh, private financing. But as you can see here, uh, if you're trying to develop and serve people at the 50% area median income and there's no tax credits and you're trying to do 50 apartments, you're gonna have to figure out how to come up with $10 million. Um, conversely, on a property that has 100 units at the same 50%, um, if you have tax credits, you, you need to figure out 5.8 million or 5.9 million. So um, regardless of the size, there's always gonna be some need to, to bring other sources of funds to the project. Um, and the way that most developers do it is they use a variety of sources. Um, this shows as a puzzle, it, uh, doing these projects, it does require a lot of piecing things together. And so whether it's um, local loan funds or federal grants, we now have a state tax credit people can tap into. Um, the developer fees, I know a lot of developers will give up some of their fees to help bridge the gap. Again, land donations is really critical. Um, that takes away a high part of the cost. So these are just multiple ways of, of pull, pulling the project together. So this, another tool that we have, and I think it could be a real game changer for the city of Tucson is looking at our public housing. Um, HUD has provided us, uh, HUD has really been pushing nationally for all housing authorities to move out of the public housing business. And I just wanna quickly say why, you know, how it works under public housing, the way it works today. Um, we get operating funding, which is a good portion of the funds to support the, the units. However, that tends to vary from year to year. HUD often has to prorate how much we get because they don't have enough funding to support all the public housing. It also uh, does not, the way it, it works is we're not allowed to borrow or leverage funds um, if we want to improve the properties. And nationally because of the, the age and um, condition of the housing stock, there's not enough capital funding to improve what's needed and what's existing. By moving to a Section 8 platform, there's a, there's a few different options. One of the, the larger ones is called the Rental Demonstration Project. It's called RAD, Rental Assistance Demonstration. Uh, it allows for predictable and stable funding. It provides regulatory relief. There's not as many um, regulations that people have to follow. And also there's an ability to leverage and improve. So a lot of housing authorities that have gone and moved to this Section 8 platform, they've utilized low-income housing tax credits and other funding sources to get the properties either new construction or rehabilitate the projects that they have. And, um, and then they're able to have a long-term sustainability plan um, on how to maintain those units. So um, I'll be 
working with staff and with HUD, where we have technical assistance with a strategy. And these are just some of the strategies that we've been, that's been recommended. Some uh, 245 units, we think we can move those very quickly into the Section 8 platform, which will help us get those properties renovated and then continue managing it. Tucson House, as you know, is our, we're working really hard to get a choice implementation grant. And we hope with that grant, along with low income housing tax credit, that we can renovate uh, and get um, Tucson House to look brand new. Uh, and still operate it under the Section 8 platform called RAD. And then the third option is we have about 623 single family or small unit uh, like duplexes that we could either do uh, affordable home ownership and keep it um, affordable in perpetuity, or we could transfer some of those units to nonprofits to operate as rental, affordable rental housing. And then finally, we believe that if we do those things, we will have funding to be able to construct some new multifamily developments and transfer those subsidies to the new development. So in looking at this, we could see a significant increase in affordable housing and have it to be quality housing. So those are, again, we plan to come back to Mayor and Council once we have that strategy more um, defined, but this is just an introduction to what that looks like. So here's um, something that I would love um, input from the commission. Um, we're calling it a checklist um, for projects that we would support as a city. Uh, mayor and council would set this policy, um, but this is what we would recommend that, that mayor and council would say, if we're gonna fund, whether it's with home funding, project-based vouchers, um, any other uh, incentives um, that we might give our impact fee waivers that we say that the, these are the type of projects we want to see. So we want either permit supportive housing projects, housing that uh, prioritizes veterans, uh, persons with disabilities, um, those who have lower affordability limits, like instead of doing 80% AMI, we may say we wanted to um, at least have a a carve out for the lower 50 or 60% of AMI, and then also longer affordability periods. Um, so these are ways that we could score and prioritize projects that get, apply for funding. And we would also use checklists to say, are, do these properties have these considerations? And again, it could be a point system. Are they um, have access to transportation, uh, close proximity to employment opportunities and schools and community centers? Um, are they close to grocery stores? Uh, also zoning, are they doing higher density? Um, do they have access to healthcare within one mile? And also do, does, it, um, shoot, does it have some deconcentration? Is it in areas where, where, where there's higher investments or higher incomes where people will have more opportunities? So these are some of the site considerations we could help uh, to use to, to evaluate projects. So these last, these two slides, I'm really interested to hear um, input from the commission. Liz, yes, I have Jim. a question. Uh, what percentage of the people that ask for assistance with funding affordable housing projects get approved versus not approved, would you say? Is it? So, so the, since I've been here, and it may, may not have be the case for, um, historically, but since I've been here, it's been really a first come first serve. So if a, pr a project is um, applies for LIHTC and they've also applied for home, as long as it meets the, the, the home regulations and we have the funding, then we commit the funds to them. And then if they get funded with LIHTC, then, then we follow through. So there's not been anything other than a affordable housing requirement has only been has been the only threshold. And I don't know if that answers. I mean, for the most part, we've been getting probably one to two projects a year. So we haven't had to turn a project away. We have limited the funding on some of the projects just because we don't have as much funding as they requested but we haven't really had to say no to anyone because we haven't had a, a lot of requests. Okay. You're anticipating more though going forward? 
Well, you know, I think with the increase that we're seeing of developers utilizing 4% tax credits that they we could be seeing more requests for home funds. Um, so I, I would love to think that we're going to have more projects done. Um, and so we just want to plan as if uh, and what I, we often get in our department is developers asking what are you looking for. And up to now we've been saying, as long as you are doing a affordable housing project that's we're happy. Um, but I'd love to say mayor and council has said we want to invest in, you know, housing for older adults, invest in housing for persons experiencing homelessness. So we have not yet um, laid out any criteria. Liz? Yes. Liz Wilson, sorry. Um, thank you so much, Liz. This was an amazing presentation. Um, and I just have a couple questions. First off, Tucson House. Um, so I'm wondering if after the renovation period, there will be any reconsideration for the people uh, living in Tucson House. I know that it has a massive amount of units and it is allocated for um, people who are aging as well as living with disabilities. And the like size of it is frequently very difficult for people to navigate is like a lot of feedback that I get. I know that when I was working in housing, people would decline Tucson House just because of that. So I'm wondering if there's any consideration to, you know, disaggregate those populations and make it more of just like a general public housing. Well, you know, I think what we've learned through choice is with all the resident <laughs> and area feedback, um, there, what we've heard is that we, they, they would like to see it to be, um, not general population, Liz, but um, a, a varying levels of um, housing for older adults. So having like, for instance, just your regular affordable housing for 55 and older, then maybe a, another section that would be like um, with some services like meals and housekeeping, and then maybe even having another section that's for assisted living. So having a combination of mixed income and services for varying um, uh, levels for, for older adults. So the feeling was to keep it for older adults. Again, that was a lot of input, but um, I, I hear you. I think um, whatever we end up doing, if it's gonna end up being for older adults that we need to make it much, much more friendly and um, a lot more services on site. Yeah, I think that especially with all of the education that you've been giving us as a commission, um, if it's going to be mostly for older adults, um, those units should be converted to two bedroom units for multi generational living or um, even like visitation of family members and stuff so sure. that older folks can can have that that accommodation. Um, but also um, one last thing. Um, the mention of retail amenities, I know that one issue I had working with people on vouchers and receiving subsidy is that um, all the places that accept vouchers and subsidy are in food deserts in Tucson. Okay. So I think that should be very high on the list. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Mindy? Yes, thank you. Um, during my 40, uh, about 40 years of watching the um, ebb and flow at the Tucson house. One, at, one, at one time, long, long ago, <laughs> I feel it's like a fairy tale, that there was a really strong community with a, commi a, a small store people could purchase things at, community meals. However, everything was shut down five years or more ago, and many of the residents there are using drugs. They no longer have somebody kind of checking people in and out. So I think increasing security mm -hmm. and the, the concern I have, it again is the food desert. I love that saying, Liz, um, about not displacing individuals with other disabilities, with disabilities over and over 
the demographic of aging individuals. Um, my, that's my concern. I hear you. Thank you. Yeah, good. No, thank you. Sharia. Yeah, I was just looking over the, the list again. Um, I thought all the site considerations were pretty great. I, I love including the food deserts. I, I think it's kind of captured in the last three with like deconcentration of poverty, but I think also in general, like maybe mixed income developments. I, I think also I, I would love to see more of, we don't really have a lot of those types of developments in Tucson. And I think it would be great to bring in more of that. Um, might also make some economic sense maybe. Um, so, um, and also with that, like, I feel like workforce housing also is just gonna become more and more of an issue moving forward in our community. And I, I know we're trying to reach very low, but there's already a lot of support for very low. I mean, in terms of federal funding, there's support for that. There isn't really any support for workforce housing. So I, I also kind of, Again, maybe with mixed income communities and something about workforce housing, I think those could also be really good goals. I, I agree. Thank you. I'll, I'll be sure to include um, that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually recognize myself here. So mm -hmm. going back to the previous slide, mm -hmm. the only other thing I would potentially um, add as a, as a, maybe a selection criteria is where you think you can get the most bang for the buck mm. in terms of uh, the most number the highest units. number of units yeah um, you know the the nine percent projects are definitely going to serve the lower income the four percent a typical four percent project is two to three hundred units versus a typical nine percent which is 40 to 60 units so sometimes you know by supporting those four percent deals it, it you get more bang for your buck in terms of the number of, of affordable units created um, you know, just a couple of things that are kind of bigger picture that, that I've been seeing this last two months since I've been on this, I wasn't here last month. Um, the state just recently passed a, uh, for a, a state tax credit. Um, uh, uh, the governor and uh, they went through the House, the Senate, and the governor, he signed it into law, I think about a month, three or four weeks ago. And so the Arizona Department of Housing is currently trying to figure out how to allocate those that it's going to ramp up I think over the next five years in terms of the amounts it's going to start fairly low and then they're going to they're going to add money to that over time uh, so that's a, that's a really good development and it's another thing that uh, that's another potential funding source for projects um, you know the other thing is I had a, a meeting with uh, the Department of Housing about two weeks ago they were doing uh, some study sessions to talk about uh, what's going to happen with the QAP and the feedback that I got from them is they're going to be making some wholesale changes to to the selection criteria of how they're going to pick projects going forward. Uh, we have the housing conference here in Tucson in two weeks. It's going to be at the Star Pass Resort. Uh, normally they issue a draft of the QAP prior to that conference so that um, there's a feedback session at the end of the conference where everybody can, all the developers and everybody who works on the program can provide feedback to the Department of Housing. Uh, so that's not going to happen this year. Uh, they just issued a, a memo saying that they're going to welcome feedback on that program, I think, for about the next month and a half. I think the, the draft QAP will be released in, uh, in about three weeks. So um, that's obviously going to have a, a, a pretty big impact on on us and how we uh, how we try to uh, position the city of Tucson for new projects going forward. It's going to be based on the changes that they make to that program. So. Well, I think that I will make sure to let them know that things are in this presentation that. We are on the cusp of big changes from the state level on the low income housing tax credit and that will have an impact um, on, on the projects that we see. So thanks, right. Jim. I'll, I'll definitely keep our eyes open so we can relay um, and uh, what what changes we see.
I, I do want to say I, I want to make sure there, there's, if there's any other comments. There is a few more slides which I can go through pretty quickly, but I, I see Mindy has a question and if anyone else has any other comments on these two slides. Yeah, Mindy. Um, yeah, actually, I had the checklist printed out mm -hmm. and I've written comments on different uh, bullet points. So I think I'll wait until the end of the slide. And for me, I would like to go through the bullet points afterwards. Sure. Okay, great. And, and you're welcome to go through them, or if you want to just take a picture and email the comments, that you feel free to do that as well for, for me to have um, as I prepare for this. Okay. Okay. I think some of it might be for discussion. Because sure. Sure. Okay. Okay, let me just um, zip through it a little bit more. Was there anyone else, Jim? I don't want to leave anyone out. Okay. Nope. Um, so some recommendations and next steps. Um, we talked about the city of Phoenix has a strategic plan. Um, we'll be hearing about that hopefully in the September meeting. But I think uh, through the commission, we can uh, create a, a similar strategic plan. Uh, which outlines some time frames and number of units we'd like to see uh, created in, in the city of Tucson. Uh, we just talked about the affordability housing checklist. Um, right now, our planning and development services department does, um, for the most part, uh, expedite permits and things for affordable housing projects. Um, one of the ideas is maybe codify that into an ordin ordinance. Um, so that developers know that that is um, one of the reasons that that just demonstrates our uh, our dis our desire to um, help those who are de developing affordable housing. Also, we know the incentives for developers. We're seeing that happening, but co continuing down that road um, as we are through the overlay district, um, developing some design standards, um, and also. Um, maybe exploring some anti-discrimination ordinance that would help um, persons with uh, subsidy or low income to not be discriminated based on income or if they have a, a voucher or rapid rehousing or something like that. So those are some things that I think on, on the policy side, mayor and council can look at those things. Um, also, we have some development projects that we are working on. Um, mayor and council has already indicated they want us to create a development corporation. Um, I already talked about the transformation of public housing. That's also called asset repositioning. So um, working towards those recommendations that I talked about earlier. Also developing a manufactured housing, a more robust program um, to um, address the dilapidated and, and um, the need that there's a desire for our families to um, purchase manufactured housing. Um, and then finally, exploring the options around um, alternative housing models like tiny homes, container homes, and of course our ADU um, uh, uh, discussions around accessory dwelling units. Yes. Yeah, that, yeah, you know, um, the other thing, the other alternative you might want to put in there because I'm I'm seeing it a lot is uh, is manufactured housing. Okay. Um, not necessarily the tiny homes or the container homes, but where they manufacture uh, part of the units and then they stack them in place like Legos. Yeah. Um, it's really difficult to do that right now because of all the city review processes. They don't know how to look at it structurally, to confirm that everything's being done to code. And, and just so that I'm so when is that the same idea as the container homes or is there another model besides the container C container homes are like used shipping containers that they convert yeah. into to home this is more like uh somebody in a factory assembles wall panels oh yeah that have, that have the flooring and everything and then and then they they attach them together like legos yeah no i i know what you're talking about now okay thank you and that is the end of the presentation. So if there's anything that anyone thinks I'll stop sharing that was missing in the presentation. Um, Those are called modular homes. Thank you. <laughs> I should know that. Oh, 
Okay, that was a great presentation. Anybody have any other final comments? Mindy. Thank you. <clears throat> I've also been reading about houses that are stacked, that you can buy a house and just unfold it, basically. Has any, and they're 3D printed. I don't know if anybody's seen those. I've seen those. Mm -hmm. Are they great? They're great. Those are modular homes. They are modular. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> Some of the comments that I had on the bullet points, the retail, the especially grocery stores, I'd like to include pharmacies mm -hmm. with those grocery stores that accept um, medic, the SSI or people who are on disability insurance, the insurance plans for indigent. Not all grocery stores do. So pharmacies are an important part for aging folks like me <laughs> and people with disabilities who take quite a few meds. Um, the higher density residential zoning score is being higher. My concern about that is many individuals whom are homeless and remain homeless, some have pets, um, dogs, and uh, are truly emotional support or therapeutic animals for them and often don't go to shelters because they are not allowed to bring their dogs with them. So <clears throat> when we look at the higher density residential zoning score, let's keep in mind not limiting pets. And also <clears throat> least restrictive environments that would mean some individuals will require, that that might bridge into another kind of housing we need to look at which would be an environment where there's intense supervision, that continuum of support. So the housing that we're talking about here probably are for people who do not require intensive supports. But pets, need, I think, are really important. Um, and then the um, deconcentration of communities of color. Um, my concern more is I'm not sure where that comes in, but some people want to stay within their community of color and that, um, that we provide opportunities for people to choose to move out of their community of color, nationality, religion, um, and, and bear mind to that piece of not everyone wants to. And we can't be so, you know, just me, be mindful of people enjoy community that they are familiar with. Um, and I think most concerning to me is most of the voucher programs where I have seen people placed, there is just rampant drug use and sales. And we, I believe need to be the extraordinarily mindful Many people with low income have or are recovering addicts as well. So I didn't mean to, you know, I can't, don't, I'm not being politically correct in how I'm saying things, but I think you all understand what I'm saying. <laughs> Thanks. That's it. Thank you, yep. Great input. Thank you very much. Shreya? Sorry, yeah, I just wanted, I have a, well, a few things. One, um, I understand the, the interest in modular, but I'm also kind of skeptical of modular housing. It tends to be really expensive if you look at it, price per square foot. And I also, I am definitely more in favor of what, Jim, what you're talking about, where you're like doing assembly lines to like speed up production. But I, really, I also think we should have some of those plants in Tucson as part of economic development. And I feel like we should also really be focusing on cultivating our local construction workforce. And I think it's important to keep remember that these are jobs. These are great, well-paying jobs that, um, so I'm less in favor of like companies that are like modular that are not based here. I'd rather see us if we're gonna go in a modular direction, try to try to do that. Again, that could be something that might be a partnership with the IDA. They do industrial development, you know, where we're, you know, creating those jobs here in Tucson. Um, but that, that's my only thought about modular. And I, and I feel like it's really expensive and 
when I've priced those tiny little like tuna can units, they're like going for like 300 a square foot and most custom home builders are building for around 200. So I just think that there's a lot of reasons why we should be trying to support our local builders um, and, and our local economy here. Um, but aside from that, the, the only other request that I had that kind of ties into that is with this accessory dwelling uh, unit, uh, this accessory dwelling amendment we're trying to get pushed through. Um, I have a request from anyone on the commission who might be interested in drafting a letter of support um, to the planning commission about this. I don't know if I'm allowed to do that, but I wanted to bring it to the table and see if anyone would be willing. Um, I just would Maria? hate to, yes. Hey, that's actually our next agenda item. So if you, okay, let's table that. All right, great. About 10, great. 10 minutes and then, okay. Awesome. Anything else? Didn't mean to cut you off. Nope, that's it. Okay, all right, Liz Wilshin. Um, to the point that Shay was making about um, like effective price points and uh, things like that for container homes, modular homes, that sort of thing. Um, something that I'm aware of is that uh, a lot of them come from like the Pacific Northwest and I just have a concern about like building materials. Uh, I worked for a long time in civil litigation and I saw a lot of product liability from products like not made for the desert. And I cannot tell you the harm that I saw um, come to people in Tucson because things were not made for the heat. And um, like container homes even coming to Tucson currently are not withstanding the elements and they do not have the shelf life of, you know, an average property that is made out of adobe or press block um, bricks or anything like that. So I think we should really consider like what has what's durable in terms of materials, like what's going to be cost effective even in the long term versus the short term. Like we're purchasing a home, not like a pair of jeans. So yeah. Hey Olga. Yeah, mine is basically the same on the manufactured. I feel that the quality is so low and the cost to fix and the fact that they don't last very long. They don't appraise well how, and they don't hold their value. They're basically like a car where they lose value every year. So that's another thing that I feel we need to take into consideration when it comes to manufactured home, along with what Shay and Liz said as well. I agree. Yeah. Okay, Mindy? I agree as well uh, there then. Uh, carbon footprint is an important uh, issue for me and sustainability and building green. Uh, some of the container homes are actually uh, well insulated. However, we have a business here in Tucson, I think it's called Mickey's, that uses a material that's made of concrete and styrofoam or something and it. You can cut it, the insulation factor is 49. Um, easy, you just kind of cut it with a knife and then but I, uh, I think I'd like to impress that the importance of building with materials good for the day. I love whoever, whoever brought that up. Thank you. Um, ugh, I can't talk anymore today. You guys cut me off. I'm 86. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Shay, did you have something else? Okay. All right, well, I thought that that was a great presentation, Liz. I think you're gonna kill it well, in a good way. I, I do appreciate everyone's uh, input. It was super helpful and I appreciate that you guys think it's, it's you know, I, I, I sometimes feel like uh, I don't wanna dumb it down too much, but at the same time, we know that these are hard concepts. And so I, your input has been extremely helpful. Thank you. Okay. So let's move on to agenda item number six, the additional dwelling unit ordinance update. Corin, do you wanna jump in? Yes, thank you. Um, and I'm gonna 
ask Shay to chime in as well. Um, but I wanted to give everyone an update on the accessory dwelling unit code amendment because um, I um, provided an update on this a few meetings ago or gave people kind of an overview. And I wanted to share an update of kind of where we're at with the proposal because it's come a long way since then, but it's still very much in progress. So basically where we're at is this is a code change. So this is a change to our zoning code to make it easier to build accessory dwelling units. Um, so what we're trying to do is amend the city's unified development code as it's called. Um, so we now have more of a fleshed out proposal than um, when we last presented. So the proposal would allow one accessory dwelling unit on any residential lot in the city. And a residential lot is any lot that has either a one or two family home already on it. Um, so it allow you know, pretty much anyone to build an ADU. That ADU would be limited in size to a thousand square feet on any lot over 7,000 square feet and 750 to any lot under 7,000 square feet. So trying to tailor that a little bit to the overall lot size. They, there would be a parking space required, although there are some waivers available for that. We want to make sure we're not requiring more parking than needed as a city um, and requiring more asphalt and paving. So that could be waived based on proximity to transit or bike infrastructure. Um, and could also be provided on street if there's availability. And we are requiring that every ADU uh, be built with a cool roof, which could be white paint or other options. So we have had a lot of um, engagement on this topic. This proposal is really informed by what we've heard from community members over the past few months that we've been discussing this. We've held, we set up a stakeholder group that includes many of you, actually a lot of housing advocates in our community, as well as neighborhood representatives, um, architects, designers, builders, kind of a range of different perspectives and areas of expertise. That group has met eight times and has really helped us with the details of this proposal. Um, we also held seven public meetings, had about 400 people attend over the course of those meetings and um, have had a lot of comments online and have a survey online that we've gotten almost 300 responses to. Um, do you have a question? Hey, thanks. Um, just a quick question. The cool, why, why do you require a cool roof? What does that have to do with anything? Good question. So, um, I would say that, so one aspect of this is about sustainability and um, kind of more sustainable development patterns. Um, we're trying to drive more infill development as a city. And there's a lot of ways that kind of development is more sustainable, building off our transit network and our existing infrastructure. But there's also a lot of concerns as a city about urban heat island effect and um, what the impact of more development is as a city. So a our, cool roof, our, we our are- solar panels, our solar Yeah, panels solar panels or? we will allow also. Um, so the idea is with the cool roof is we're trying to mitigate the increased density with something that is very doable. And one reason that we are requiring this is um, that this is something that we think there's, shouldn't add significant cost to the ADU because another goal is affordable housing. Um, because there's so many options out there today, everything from just a white coating on your roof to like high tech shingles, um, we felt like this could be accomplished without adding cost to the ADU. Um, and I would say that this is maybe, I don't want to say pilot, but it's something that we see being um, incentivized perhaps in other ways with other new development in the future as we start to think more about climate action and cooling our city, I think we're looking for other ways to incentivize or require these types of options. Liz, do you have a question? Yeah, does the coding have to be reapplied by any standards or anything? It would be for maintenance. Um, I mean, we will only be checking it at the time that it's built as part of the building inspection. But yes, most do, like white coatings do. Um, yeah, it depends, so, it depends on the type of roof, Liz. 
yeah, it would depend on the material. Um, so um, we've gotten a lot of good response. We have, um, like I mentioned, we have a survey that we've gotten a lot of responses to, mostly positive about um, the proposal. However, there are concerns in a number of aspects, some about the ADU size, just are these too large for certain lots, um, and how will they relate to the primary structure? Um, owner occupancy is an issue. There's some concerns about Airbnb and short-term rentals. Um, there's some concerns in historic neighborhoods about whether this is compatible with preservation goals um, and existing designs and then affordability and, you know, the cost to build these, well, how can we make them affordable as a community? Um, and parking is also a concern in um, certain neighborhoods in particular. Um, so that's kind of the quick overview. I think most of you are familiar with kind of what an ADU is at this point, a casita, what we're talking about. We're talking about an independent living space that has its own kitchen, so it really can function as its own housing unit. Um, as I mentioned, some of the goals are really creating more housing and especially affordable housing as a community, and in particular, providing more housing options for seniors as people want to age in place. And then um, really trying to shift our development patterns towards more infill and a more climate resilient form of development. Um, so where we are today, um, as I mentioned, this is, we've been working on this for about eight or nine months now. Um, we just held a um, public hearing with the planning commission just last week. At that time, they decided to continue this item or the public hearing, I should say. So. Um, there's going to be another public hearing uh, in September. And so that's why we want to give you all an update. As Sharia mentioned, it would be great to get input on this and hear from the Housing Commission, either as a body, um, like a formal letter from the Housing Commission um, with support or input about this proposal and or as individuals. Um, many of you are very involved in these issues. So it'd also be great to hear from you or your other or your organizations on this topic. Um, so this is just a little more about the outreach. As I mentioned, we've done, um, we've heard a lot. We've done a lot of outreach. We're also working on some ways to do additional outreach in, in the next few weeks before the next public hearing. We're sending out a um, postcard to neighborhood associations, um, putting a lot more materials on our website in Spanish. That was kind of a um, an area we really needed to, to strengthen um, and really trying to encourage people to take our survey uh, so that we have more input that way. So we'll be trying to use our, the city's social media channels. Um, we're potentially trying to produce a video that would help um, drive people to our website to learn more about the proposal and just explain what casitas and accessory dwelling units are. So those are some of the things we're working on um, with outreach. Um, and then, so just to clarify kind of what's allowed today um, and what will be different with this code amendment, today, basically any site in the city can build a guest house or sleeping quarters, but it cannot be a living, a separate living space with its own kitchen. It's really meant to be um, almost like an extension of the house, but just detached. Um, you also can do a second residential unit on certain lots that are large enough um, that qualify in zoning, but those are, especially in R1, which is our most common zoning district, not many lots meet that threshold. So they would have to be 10,000 square feet or more in an R1 residential district in order to have a second dwelling unit. So the idea with accessory dwelling units is to allow for that accessory dwelling unit on really any residential lot in the city with the size restrictions and other requirements that we mentioned for parking and cool roof, et cetera. So that's kind of a summary of the proposal. Um, here's some renderings we created just to show kind of what the impacts might be in terms of visual, the visual feel in a neighborhood. Um, and one thing that um, I wanna point out is we looked at a lot of other cities around the country that have allowed accessory dwelling units in recent years, um, like Portland, LA, San Diego, Austin, a bunch of other cities. And um, you know, while this has, produced housing um, and it's over time um, can really help provide more housing as a community. It's really kind of in the hundreds of units per year. So this is not something we see would have, um, you know, a concentrated impact in neighborhoods. 
Um, I think they would be pretty spread out and would kind of happen very slowly um, over time in neighborhoods across Tucson. But this is kind of trying to give a perspective of what it might feel like if, say, your neighbor was to build a casita in their backyard. Um, so um, this is kind of a one-story ADU. We did do a rendering of a two-story ADU because our zoning would allow um, up to 25 feet. That's what we currently allow for any residential um, unit in most um, of our single family districts. Um, and while we do not think this would be very common based on cost and just sort of what we see already, um, we don't see a lot of homes built that are two stories in Tucson. Um, just out of cost in our building style, there's some advantages in some cases, um, for example, on smaller lots where you might be also trying to retain vegetation or work around other, other constraints on your lot, like utilities and things like that, um, where a smaller footprint can be very efficient, could allow parking with a unit above, that kind of thing. Um, and um, what we also really wanted to discuss with this commission in particular is how to ensure affordability of at least a portion of the ADUs that are built, um, because that is a major goal. So while we know not all ADUs are intended to be affordable, um, this is also a way just to create kind of, um, you know, housing that is more attainable and accessible or can be just extra space for family members, that kind of thing. Um, we do um, want to make sure that um, some of the ADUs that are built are affordable. So we're working with um, Piglet and Quadro, um, and they are developing a program geared towards um, providing technical assistance and doing outreach to low and moderate income households on um, helping them um, build ADUs, kind of the whole process, design, building, financing, all of that. Um, and in addition to that, we're looking at some other options like model plans and um, other local funding um, through potential partners in the community. So Shreya, do you want to say anything about your program? Um, yeah, I just, um, I don't want to take up too much time, but yes, we're just at the very beginnings of this. Right now we're in the research and development phase. Probably we'll be here for about a year. We're really taking a deep dive looking at, um, we're lucky in Tucson because other, other cities are like 10 years ahead of us. So other cities have had time to see units built, to develop programs. And so there's a lot to be gleaned as to what's gonna work for our community. It's what's really encouraging is seeing all the nonprofits that have stepped up in this um, new, it's basically, basically you're kind of creating a new housing market. And so it's exciting in that way, be, again, from a lot of perspectives from you know, economic development, but also just flexibility for families. Um, and what's really encouraging to me, again, is just seeing how many nonprofit financial institutions have stepped up, how many nonprofit housing institutions have stepped up. Um, people are creating all kinds of programming from focusing on housing houseless folks to, you know, family support to just a variety of, of issues. So it, it's really exciting. I feel like it's gonna do way more good than harm. I think that we can, can't really, it's tough to control. I mean, in any type of development, you can't ever really control 100% the market, but um, but I, I really feel like, um, uh, yeah, it has, it has the potential just to do a lot of good. And um, I got to meet with um, LA Moss actually yesterday and spoke with them. They have developed an affordable ADU program where they partnered with Section 8, and we're developing these affordable units in exchange uh, uh, with like some, you know, really great loan terms and loan products in exchange for a five-year commitment to housing folks on, with Section 8. Um, and then there were other incentives as well um, uh, with the pro with their program. Um, they also had a lot of grant money. They had a lot of grant money that got dumped into that project. Um, so, so it was interesting. It was interesting to hear uh, they had a partnership. It was a design build collaboration, a partnership between a builder. Just, it just was a nexus of just a ton of partnerships. And I see this also in Tucson. Our, we're going to be unfolding something similar, and and we're just we're going to be looking for partners. We're meeting with a lot of people right now, just trying to find 
all the right partners in all the right sectors. So um, it's a it's a it's a pretty daunting task. It's it's gonna it's a lot. It's pretty big scope. But um, I, I'm optimistic. I think a lot of people are interested in the issue. I think there's a lot of nonprofits who are interested, and um, I'm very optimistic. Uh, Mr. Chair, regarding the letter of, of support, you know, if the commission wants that done, if we could get direction, I can ask um, one of my staff to put together what the commission wants it to say, and then we can ha send it uh, out for everyone to to give like their email vote that that's what they want the commission letter to say, and then we can have you as the chair, Jim, sign that if that's what you would like yeah. to do. I'm fine with that. I told Sharia that I'd be willing to sign it, send it personally. Uh, is that you think it'd be better to have it come from the commission versus us as individuals? I I do. I think it would be better from the commission. I mean, I think individuals would be great. I think with TOEFL, TOEFL Dent, could we get a TOEFL Dent letterhead as well? <laughs> I think that might also be great. But um, but uh, but yeah, I think the, from the commission would be amazing. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm good with that. I'll, uh, if, um, Shreya, do, Shreya, do you have something you want to draft up that, that we can send or how would you like to handle that? Am I, am I allowed to do that? I don't know. I, if I, if I'm allowed to, I would, I would, uh, be happy to do that. Um, but I, I'm just not quite sure of the rules if I'm, if it's a conflict of interest. <laughs> So I think uh, we can work together and make sure, again, I think the, the key is not so much who drafts it, but that everyone can read it and give their, their um, what's the word, consensus to it. And then, yeah. then you will know, Jim, that, you know, everyone was agreeable to how it was written to, to the okay. content. Okay, so if, we, so if I bring a draft to the next meeting, it, that should happen right in time before the next planning commission meeting um with i think that'll give us enough time does that sound about right or should it circulate an email or i don't i'm not sure the timing i think circulate an email yeah i agree i think if we could circulate an email beforehand okay great i'll just um draft something and then send it through the email chain and I could make a Google Doc so we could all revise and edit as, as needed. Okay. Liz Wilson. Yeah, so I'm curious. Um, I also have the concerns that were mentioned about um, Airbnbs or short-term rentals. And I am curious whether there's, there's any data about the housing that was created, whether any of it being tracked um into actually creating affordable housing or if it created short-term rentals instead or a little bit of both and also if there was any sort of like accountability mechanism or lever put in place like um some sort of taxation mechanism or something like that for airbnbs by those jurisdictions um, I will. So the problem we have in Arizona is that we can't do anything about short term rental. I mean, it's the state legislature won't allow us to tax it. I thought I think of anything of any of the solutions that have been proposed in other communities that make sense to me is to tax it to tax short term rentals for and then whatever the, that tax does that that would support affordable housing right so you're actually used trying to solve the problem with a solution. Um, but in Arizona, we're not allowed to do that. So there, we're very limited in, as to what we can legally, how we can even restrict short-term rentals. But I don't think that the fear of that should stop basically families from being able to use their lots as they see fit. And what's crazy to me is that like, for example, today, if you're, which most of Tucson single family zoning, it's like 75% single family zoning. If you were to want to create a little like, duplex or even just a little casita for your family member, you're not allowed to do that. It's illegal. And the majority of these, most of the data shows that the majority of people who are using these, it's they're mostly owner occupied units. So it's mostly people who own 
the unit who are building them. And then the reasons why people build them are varied. It's everything from family. And actually for a lot of working, like working class folks, they do rent them on short-term rentals, but they're also maybe housing friends or family in the interim. And they're just totally using them in a flexible way to either provide income to help them stay in their neighborhoods or to, again, house family or friends who are like in between housing. Um, and so that's, that's what I feel like is way, way more common of, of how people are using them than the, the, than, the, than the other end of the spectrum because these lots are so difficult to develop. They're so hard to develop that like they're just not appetizing for big developers. Like if anyone's gonna, there are some companies I've seen pop up who are like um, kind of creating like, like, the, like they'll build their your unit for you but the but they'll give you like a cut of the profits and the rents, um, and those ones are kind of interesting models. But most of those also are going for like market rate. They're not really like super expensive. So I don't, I I really don't. I haven't seen any data that shows that they're like, I don't know that they're that they're being used in super predatory predatory ways. But um, but it's all kind of, you know, it's all still new and unrolling. So there's not a ton of like super great data out there. So if I can jump in a couple of things, I would say it when I was working before I became official here in Tucson, I was staying at some Airbnbs that were in ADUs. And when you're staying there, you know, the owners are in the house right next to you. You tend to not want to cause too much trouble. It's more of the whole house that's rented out is I think more problematic to neighbors than when it's just an ADU. That's my own personal experience. But um, but I was gonna say, as far as the letter, I wanna get back to that. Um, I Thanks to Allison um, to keep, keep us straight here. We can't do a shared doc. So I, I go back to, let's give Shay a couple high, uh, main points we want in the letter and then we'll, we'll send the letter out the way we do the agenda or put it on the the website so everyone can look at that and and if and if agreeable we can always vote on it at the next me meeting but we want to give people time to look at it and um, be able to offer any um, feedback through email i just also want to respond quickly to liz's question um and say that we do have some data liz on um kind of rents. And this is something we shared with the planning commission. It's a little grainy, I can tell the graphic, but basically the point, and this is um, research that was done in the Bay Area, looking at secondary units or accessory dwelling units. And one of the big takeaways is that these units tend to rent for a lower price than other units in that neighborhood or that area. So it's a way of kind of bringing in a mix of rental price points into a neighborhood and um, creating more mixed income neighborhoods. So they do tend to be lower cost relative to the area they're developed. Um, and in terms of Airbnb is, yeah, as Shreya mentioned, those um, were prohibited by the state legislature from regulating them, but many other cities and states do have some ability to regulate. And Shreya just shared one idea on taxation and how to use that. So that's something that could be in the letter um, from the commission, if that was of interest to just kind of mention that as an area that you'd like to see more policy or more authority for the city and encourage mayor and council to advocate for that to the state legislature. I know that has been on our legislative agenda um, and hasn't made much headway, but underscoring that could be something you guys want to do. Mark? I have a, a couple of... I. I hate to say this, uh, I'm a stakeholder, but I'm a lame stakeholder. Um, and um, so I'm just, uh, this has been such like a no brainer to me, which I should know better than no brainers when it comes to this kind of stuff. But uh, are we, at, does the fact that this was continued on the on the commissions, uh, they continued the hearing, does that mean there's more problem with getting this passed than I anticipated there would be? Um, so good point. So they kept the public hearing open because yeah, they do want to hear more input. There was 14 speakers at the hearing. Um, and there was 
actually eight in favor and six opposed. Um, okay. But I think they heard a lot of concerns from neighborhoods about, you know, what the impact is going to be. And on, you know, residents and neighborhoods concerned about historic um, kind of impacts and historic compatibility, the size of these EDUs, um, you know, to, that they're too big, either the footprint or the height. Um, and um, the kind of Airbnb concerns with short-term rentals was another key point. I would say those were kind of the, the concerns, the top concerns they heard. Um, I, I understand the concern about taxing Airbnbs, but frankly, my concern about putting that in this letter um, is that we may attract a different kind of opposition to, to this. Mm -hmm. um, if we if we sort of drag that into the mix and i would say given all the other stuff that i've little i've heard related to parking and historic and all those sort of issues i don't think we probably need to stir up any more um you know um i i just think that's we can't do anything about that in the context of this because the state law um wouldn't be my it, I, I'm, I just don't know that this is the context I would use for that. That That's my two cents, but I'm not voting, so. Your input is very important, Mark. Well, thank you. As, as all the folks at this year. I would just add that I think if the letter can be general, uh, in general, if everyone uh, feels that we support Arizona, uh, ADUs because of the need for more housing, uh, especially for homeowners to have options to be able to um, add additional space for family and uh, family members. Um, those are some of my thoughts around it. Would there, is there other reasons that commission members would say that having uh, this ordinance is needed? For me, it's a really important missing middle housing option for both seniors and just regular like young people like it's a missing middle housing option it's not the lowest of the low it's not the highest of the high it's a just a really great middle of the road housing option which those types of units are also rapidly decreasing and they will continue to in my opinion with the ways that zoning limits limits the supply of housing it literally limits the supply of housing we're seeing this you know, prices go up because the stock is so limited. And I just think it's just a great, again, it's not the lowest of the low, it's, it's not that, but it's just great workforce housing. And for, for seniors, especially who can't afford luxury via developments, like this is a fantastic solution. Um, so I, I feel like for all those reasons, um, just really emphasizing what it is what it is good for, as opposed to all the things that it can't do, you know, um, I think is really important. Um, and I think that the Airbnb issue is a really important issue and important topic, but to me, it's a separate, it's a separate set of issues that we can't even address at a citywide level. It's a state legend. So to me, separating the two issues is also, I think, strategically important. Okay, that's good. Before we uh, move on to the next topic, are there any other co final comments? Thank you, Corin. It was a great update. Thank you all for your for tracking this and for your support. And um, yeah, I would encourage any of you to attend on the fifteenth if you're interested. Okay, um, our next agenda item is to talk about uh, future agenda items on this meeting. So our next meeting is gonna be on September 2nd. Uh, we're hoping that the subcommittees can meet before that meeting and uh, provide a brief update on, on, uh, on how things are going. Uh, we're also asking that the, uh, the Phoenix, City of Phoenix staff who did the housing plan uh, will be available to kind of share with with us what they did up in, up in, in that city. Uh, I'd like to ask if there's any other uh, potential agenda items that um, anyone would like to see in our next meeting.
Mindy. Thank you. I think um, Ricky, one of the call to the audience two meetings ago had talked about changing call to the audience to the end of our agenda. Yes, that's our last agenda item. Oh, didn't look, thank you. See, I told okay. you I was 86. <laughs> okay, so if there's no other agenda items, we'll, uh, uh, we'll get together with, uh, with Mike, Liz, and Ann, and we'll, we'll discuss internally and see if, if we can come up with something else. Our last agenda item is agenda item eight, the call to the audience. And this is the time when any member of the public may address the Commission on Equitable Housing and Development. Due to time constraints, the to total time allocated for this is 15 minutes. Individuals are allowed up to three minutes each. Due to the open meeting laws, Commission members cannot discuss topics that are not on the agenda. Items brought up by the public may be considered as an agenda item for a future meeting. So, uh, Joe Adino, is that correct pronunciation? That is correct. Can you hear me? Yep, you have the floor. Great, thanks. Um, I want to talk about ADUs, but I've got a couple of procedural kind of things I wanted to hit on first. Uh, first, I notice on our agendas, it doesn't give a time frame for how long you're going to talk about things. Some uh, meetings do that. I think it would be good to have. Number two, call the audience at the end of the meeting. I actually don't like that. I like it at the beginning of the meeting. I can look because, I, you know, you put out your agenda a week beforehand. I can look at that agenda, talk about what's going to be on that agenda. And then when you vote about things or talk about ADUs or something, you can have my comments in mind while you do it. And hey, I don't know if I'm going to change anybody's mind about anything but I like the illusion of that at least. If I speak about it at the end of the meeting, you may have already voted about what I wanna talk about. Um, so, you know, uh, and the next meeting agenda isn't out yet. So at the end of the meeting, I got nothing to do but tell you about stuff you already just talked about or voted on. Um, so I kind of like it at the beginning. Um, number three, I think it would be nice if there was an email contact for this, um, this commission. I don't see one on your website. Uh, I know Planning Commission has one. They've got Planning Commission at TucsonAZ.gov. So um, if there's another way to um, tell you about something that's on my mind, I think that would be great to have. Um, with regards to things you talked about today, um, you know, when I saw that, that we're going to have a development corporation, I thought that maybe that was going to be something that could f uh, move forward with even more public housing. And I know that that's not, that, that HUD is really pushing to get out of that. And, and Liz Morales has, has talked about those things. I hope there are groups pushing back on that. Um, I think, you know, in the whatever 22 years since Faircloth, Tucson has lost what, 20% of its public housing units. I, I think if I remember right, our limit is 1,926. And I always hear we're around 1,500 and something. You know, that loss I think is something that's important to us. And, and we have to keep remembering so much of, of the last 50 years of turning affordable housing and those kind of things over to the market have got us here. And my concern is it's continuing with that isn't gonna to totally get us out. Um, so if I got a minute, ADUs. Um, I was one of the people who spoke at the planning commission. If you wanna hear my whole comments on that, there they were uh, at that meeting. Um, I support the concept of ADUs. I like the idea. I have the same concerns about short-term rentals that have been iterated by a few people. Um, and I, I think I look at this the other way. I, I know Sherea said, hey, you know, maybe we can lobby for ADUs and then talk about short-term rental regulations. I think the other way around is a, a better way to do it. If the state allowed some regulation on that and Tucson passed rules for um, ADU regulation, then I think I'd be able to get behind this ADU ordinance. Uh, but as it is, I can't. One of the other comments somebody made at Planning Commission was that the uh, 2006 Prop 207 um, issue, where if you if you're doing this ADU ordinance, and I'm sorry I'm going over my time a little, but um, if you do this ADU ordinance, it's probably going to end up tough to roll back unless you sunset it, because uh, if you're making any change to that to narrow the ordinance, you may see a lawsuit for diminishing value. Um, outside of that, uh, I want to thank everybody for being on this commission and giving your time to it. I've either been at every one of this meeting these meetings or watched it afterwards. And, and I look forward to the fact that you're getting into actual policy now and starting to talk about the issues and solutions. So thank you all very much and have a good day. Thank you, Joe, appreciate your comments. Anyone else? OK, 
Okay, hearing none, uh, I would uh, adjourn the meeting. Uh, it's 5.57, so we're three minutes early today. Good job, everyone. <laughs> so, um, thank you. I will talk to you all again next month, if not before. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.